the paper I'm going to be talking about today is about uh, disagreement in two domains. So on one hand, a certain kind of normative disagreement about uh, matters of taste, something we just heard quite a lot about uh, in the previous session. And uh, these disagreements uh, are about uh, claims like these, that cake is tasty, that will refer to as fun, that book is interesting, involving uh, a class of predicates that have often been called predicates of personal taste or taste predicates. This class of predicates is a bit hard to pick out very precisely. Um, you might roughly say that they're used to express our sort of subjective evaluations of things. A lot of people writing uh, about them in the literature have relied on a few canonical examples, <coughs> and uh, I'm basically going to follow that today and uh, use Tasty as my main example. In any case, my main interest in this paper isn't uh, in predicates of taste themselves and disagreement involving them, but rather in uh, comparing how disagreement about taste involving predicates of personal taste goes with disagreement in a second domain, which is uh, about appearances. So over claims uh, like these, for example, that cake tastes vegan, the dress looks white, the carpet feels soft. And uh, these are claims involving a uh, class of predicates that I'll call appearance predicates, which I'll take to be formed from an appearance verb plus an adjective, where uh, an appearance verb is just, well, one of these five that you learned in <coughs> kindergarten, tastes, looks, feels, uh, smells, and sounds. Arguably, seems should be included in this class, but I'm going to focus today just on um, these verbs associated with particular sensory modalities, just to start somewhere. Um, and actually, the examples that I'll use today just involve tastes, but that's simply uh, because I liked the parallelism with tasty and tastes, but uh, the claims I make about appearance predicates, I mean to cover this, this whole class. Um, I mean, also, I'm really just going to be making claims about um, taste predicates and appearance predicates in English. Although I do hope, uh, you know, that, that these claims aren't um, idiosyncratic to English. So, you know, one thing, uh, you know, I'd be happy to hear from people in the audience who speak other languages whether <laughs> they cause problems for my claims. Um, okay. Now, uh, disagreement about matters of taste has uh, generated a lot of discussion in recent years. It's been thought to be distinctive in a certain way, which I'll try and make a bit more precise shortly. But basically, the claim that I'm going to be arguing for today is that disagreement about appearances is actually distinctive in exactly the same way. So uh, in short, our account of disagreement about, for example, whether things are tasty should apply uh, equally well to disagreement over how things taste, as well as look, feel, smell, sound. Now, uh, before getting more into that, I thought I would say uh, a little bit about the background project that this um, paper is a part of, which is uh, about the language of appearance and evaluation more generally, uh, a project that is still in its very early stages, but still, I think just a few words about this might help motivate um, uh, the project of today's paper. So, uh, as we've uh, heard already a bit today, Certain features of uh, taste predicates have driven recent debates uh, in semantics and theory of communication over views like relativism, contextualism, and so on. And uh, also, as uh, you know, Sidora's paper uh, probably convinced a lot of us, it's actually really hard to take a certain behavior of these predicates and clearly say whether it favors one of these views over another. So. Um, my interest at this point isn't going to be to make a move in these semantic debates, but rather to uh, start investigating the question, or to, to um, further get the investigation of the question of what range of expressions have these features that drive the semantic debates in the first place, whatever we end up wanting to say about them. And uh, in particular, uh, we can ask, well, uh, do uh, appearance predicates have these features? Two. Um, now, right, we know at least one appearance predicate, by my definition, does, because you know, it's just kind of a mundane point that tasty and taste good are synonymous. But uh, we might ask whether you know, these, uh, these features are just sort of particular to appearance predicates that are also evaluative, or whether it's actually a broader phenomenon. And so uh, the question that I'm, I've been investigating is, well, you know, what's the contribution generally of an appearance verb like tastes? in a complex taste predicate like tastes good. Um, and, uh, my, and 
and following on from that, the question of just generally how we should theorize about the semantics and uh, communicative effects of appearance language. And uh, that the uh, answer that I'm leaning towards is that actually the answer is, um, well, <laughs> I don't know, but whatever it is, it should be basically the same as what we say about taste predicates. Uh, so that's, that's the, the background for the paper that I'm going to be discussing today, which focuses mainly on disagreement, but also uh, gets into some of these broader issues. Okay, so here's the plan for the rest of today. Next, I am going to talk a bit about disagreement about taste in particular and try and characterize what's uh, supposed to be distinctive about it in comparison to disagreement in other domains uh, enough and try and characterize it just enough so that we can be in a position to tell whether we're dealing with the same thing in the realm of appearances as well. Uh, but before getting to disagreement about appearances itself, I'm going to look a bit more uh, generally at taste predicates and appearance predicates in comparison with one another and uh, argue that on a number of linguistic features, they pattern together and uh, differently from more objective or absolute predicates. It's kind of warm us up to the idea that we should potentially treat these um, the same way as far as the semantic debates of recent years are concerned. Uh, then I'll focus in a little more on appearance predicates themselves and argue that they can get uh, two rather different kinds of interpretations. And finally, I'll come back to disagreement, consider how it goes in all of these cases, and suggest that um, we're dealing with the same kind of behavior across the board. <coughs> okay. So, disagreement about taste. Well, <laughs> I um, am, must apologize for not at all taking Isadora's lesson of looking for naturally occurring uh, disagreements about taste, and I'm going to go back to this super common old example of a two-line dialogue where um, two people have each tried the same cake, and <laughs> one liked it and the other didn't, and uh, so the first A says that cake is tasty, and B disagrees. No, it's not tasty. So uh, on the face of it, it seems that there's a disagreement here, right? A and B disagree about whether the cake is tasty. And yet, uh, this disagreement doesn't seem to be just like sort of ordinary factual disagreement. So we could compare it to another disagreement that A and B might have in this context over whether the cake is vegan, for example, um, in two here. Here also there's a disagreement over uh, whether the cake is vegan. And moreover, in this case, it seems like you know, either A or B is simply making a mistake about what the cake is like, right? Either it's vegan or it's not. And once the fact of the matter comes to light, one of them will just have to admit that they were making a mistake. Now, uh, there's this sense, a lot of people have had the sense that the disagreement about taste in one is not quite like this. That uh, there's the possibility that so long as both speakers were sincere in their assertions that neither of them might actually be making a mistake at all. One way to maybe draw that out a little more is to say that it would be kind of weird to sort of require either of them to take back what they said so long as they were being sincere. Whereas, of course, in uh, the case in two, one of them will just have to take back uh, what they said. It doesn't matter how sincerely they believed um, their, what, they, what they said. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you can also contrast the disagreement about taste with uh, a third kind of disagreement. So uh, Ethan previewed this one in his comments to the previous talk. So we could have uh, A in New York and B in Berkeley. They're talking on the phone. B falsely believes that A is also in Berkeley and it's raining in New York, but not in Berkeley. And they might have this exchange. A says it's raining here. B says no, it's not raining here. Um, now, in this case, it seems also like neither speaker might be making a mistake, at least as far as like, the claim they're making in this dialogue is concerned. Um, but also, it seems like there actually isn't a disagreement here at all, right? Because of false background beliefs, they believe that their words here refer to the same location. In fact, they don't. Once this misunderstanding is cleared up, they'll just you know, accept that they were both right. Um, there's no feeling of incompatibility at all. So uh, I want to try and bring out what's distinctive about disagreement about taste by comparing it with these two other kinds of cases that are like hopefully better understood. By contrast with the factual disagreement in two, um, we feel like there's a sense in which neither might be making a mistake. We wouldn't require either of them to take back what they said. 
But uh, also, by contrast with three, there really is an incompatibility there. Um, one way to sort of gloss this a little um, more, uh, pull this out a little more, is to say that you know someone else overhearing this phone conversation between A and B, knowing the misunderstanding, could just say, yeah, they're both right. I accept both of their claims. That would be a very odd uh, reaction to someone overhearing the disagreement about taste. I mean, these things have been pointed out in, in the literature. I, this isn't uh, new to me. Um, so, right, this kind of situation has been called thoughtless disagreement. We yeah, have disagreement in the taste case. Disagreement in the sense that uh, can flesh that out a little more by saying a third party observer couldn't agree with both claims. And yet, thoughtlessness, which we might gloss a little more explicitly as we wouldn't require either speaker to take back what they said. Now, I should um, just sort of flag, of course, uh, different particular accounts will say different things about what exactly the disagreement and the thoughtlessness consist in. Some might even explain away the appearance of one or the other of these features. Um, I am quite convinced by the previous talk that it's actually really hard to take this data um, to be you know, conclusive uh, at all in, in this debate. But um, you know, I think that there, there's, there's something behind the intuitive judgments of each of these. And I hope that the characterization that I've given will be enough to allow us to figure out whether disagreement about appearances um, has the same features, and so, you know, if the disagreement is to be explained away in the case of disagreement about taste, should plausibly also be explained away in the case of disagreement about appearances, for example. Um, but I'm just going to call the sort of intuitive phenomenon, which could be accounted for in a number of different theories, thoughtless disagreement, fleshed out <coughs> uh, the way I have it here. Okay. But, uh, okay, before going, getting back to disagreement, let me say a bit about taste and appearance predicates in general. And I'm going to go through, just sort of observe three features of taste predicates that have been discussed quite a lot in the literature about them. And for each, I'll observe that appearance predicates are the same. Actually, the first two are things that uh, were touched on in the previous talk as well. <coughs> so, right, it's been noted many times that Certain prepositional phrases specifying a relevant experiencer are licensed by taste predicates. That cake is tasty to me, that's fine. By contrast, that cake is vegan to me, is not fine. Um, lots of questions about what the contribution of this prepositional phrase is. Um, but sort of throughout this talk, my goal is going to be to uh, characterize the data in a way that I hope people in lots of positions in these debates could get on board with. So I'll just sort of leave it uh, at this for now and observe that, if, you know, pretty clearly, if we put uh, an appearance predicate in there, that cake tastes vegan to me is completely fine, and uh, also that cake tastes good to me. Include these two appearance predicates. Both are appearance predicates for my purposes, appearance for adjective. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll include both in anticipation of um, the third section of my talk where these will fall on opposite sides of the distinction that I'll draw. But as far as um, these features go, they pattern together with taste predicates against the more uh, objective or absolute predicate, vegan. Okay. Second, uh, embedding under subjective attitude verbs. So I think the clearest example of this in English is find. I don't know what to say about consider. <laughs> um, so right, certain uh, attitude verbs are a bit picky about what kinds of clauses they can embed. This is generally observed. Uh, I find the cake tasty is uh, fine. By contrast, I find the cake vegan um, is very odd. Now, I want to compare uh, appearance predicates on this feature. It's a little hard uh, in English just because, uh, as you'll notice, actually the clauses embedded under find uh, don't have a conjugated verb. Uh, and appearance predicates, as I've defined them, you know, include verbs. So. The parallel won't be perfect, but I think, I think we can sort of make it work and get the contrast that we want simply by observing. Um, you know, I find that the cake is tasty. It's probably a little less natural than, than eight, but it's still clearly better than 11. I find that the cake is vegan. And here we've kind of fit the data into the form where we do have a conjugated verb in the embedded clause. And I think once we do this, uh, 
we notice that uh, when you put an appearance predicate in the embedded clause, the acceptability is, is just <laughs> the same. Actually, maybe if not better, I don't know, than uh, with the taste predicates. I find that the cake tastes good. I find that the cake tastes vegan. These are both acceptable with um, subjective attitude verbs. Um, so I do have one little piece of cross-linguistic data uh, which supports this uh, this claim, if you're uncomfortable with the sort of massaging that needs to be done in English to get the conjugated verb, there's the subjective attitude verb, uh, zinus, in Danish, that always embeds a full clause. And I mean, this isn't my data, it's from um, someone who, who is a native speaker, unlike myself, and uh, the contrast is apparently very clear. This is with looks, but um, I do have one with tastes as well. Basically, with the subjective attitude verb, um, uh, John believes subjectively that the dress looks white is completely fine. Um, and John uh, <coughs> believes, I uh, changed, oh, no, thinks subjective that the dress is white is um, marked. So this just kind of supports the idea that uh, the sort of trick we had to do in English to get the parallel was, was legit, and that uh, appearance verbs have whatever subjectivity is required to embed under subjective attitude verbs, just like taste predicates do. Um, okay. Third, this is a piece of data of a bit of a, a different kind but I think it's pretty striking. Uh, oh yes, I have my one historical quote of the talk here from Kant. Uh, it's been pointed out as far back as uh, Kant's critique of judgment, maybe even earlier, that uh, judgments that things have certain aesthetic qualities, uh, including those denoted by predicates of taste, seem to require a first-hand experience on the part of the person making the judgment. So he writes, for even if someone lists all the ingredients of a dish, pointing out that I've always found each of them agreeable, and goes on to praise this food, I shall be deaf to all these reasons. I shall try the dish on my tongue and palate, and thereby make my judgment. So, uh, in less uh, <laughs> florid terms, this first-hand uh, experience requirement comes out in the uh, markedness of a claim like uh, the one in 17. That cake is tasty, but I haven't tried it. It's a question what's going wrong here. Um, some opt for a sort of more semantic account, saying that it's actually a a presupposition of a sort of uh, the claim that the cake is tasty, that the speaker has tried it, so that uh, the deviance here would be something like, um, my sister is coming to visit, but I don't have a sister. Um, I, am, I am more inclined towards a, a sort of pragmatic or epistemic account, which others have also argued for, um, where it's not a presupposition of the cake being tasty that the speaker has tried it, but rather sort of condition on the warranted assertability of the claim. So that would make uh, the, the problem with 17 more like a sort of Morian epistemic contradiction, like um, it's raining but I don't believe it is. Uh, either way, uh, right, so, oops. Um, either way, of course, so the, the requirement isn't there with an objective predicate that cake is vegan, but I haven't tried it, so I haven't tried it. Um, uh, it's totally fine. <laughs> Sorry, that was a bad joke. I like vegan food. Um, uh, that's fine, and uh, when you put an appearance predicate, um, uh, you get the same requirement, as I think we saw quite clearly. We, we see the same requirement as there is with taste predicates, so that could taste good, but I haven't tried it. That could taste vegan, but I haven't tried it. These are marked uh, in just the same way as 17 is. Okay, so these are just some uh, parallels between taste and appearance predicates to uh, not, a, not a complete argument, but just a suggestion that there are some interesting similarities between them as far as um, semantics or theory of communication and pragmatics goes. <coughs> okay, so next uh, I'm going to look a little more closely at appearance predicates. And, uh, right, I want to point out an intuitive difference uh, between certain appearance predicates. It comes out in the following observation. So, I take this sentence, that cake tastes vegan, involving an appearance predicate. Uh, this seems to be saying oops, basically the same thing as that cake tastes as if it is vegan. By contrast, if we take uh, another sentence, also with an appearance predicate, that cake tastes good, it doesn't seem quite right to say this means exactly the same thing as that cake tastes as if it is good. Now, <laughs> um, if people laugh, I feel like that means you agree. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to follow some terminology in uh, philosophy of perception, and I'll 
label the first kind of appearance predicate here an uh, epistemic appearance predicate, and the second kind, uh, with taste good, phenomenal appearance predicate. Now, uh, let me say uh, a little more about each of these. So, epistemic appearance predicates. Again, uh, the main example, that cake tastes vegan, means basically the same thing as that cake tastes as if it is vegan. It seems like what's going on here is uh, we're citing an appearance as kind of evidence for a taste-independent state of affairs, namely the cake being vegan. By contrast, with phenomenal appearance predicates, that cake tastes good, not quite the same as that cake tastes as if it is good. Here, what I want to suggest is we're characterizing the appearance directly, so to speak. We're not uh, saying that the cake tastes as if it has a taste-independent kind of goodness. Rather, uh, the kind of goodness we're interested in here is the taste kind of goodness. We're saying that the cake is good tasting or good in way of taste. So that's the intuitive distinction. I want to go through uh, three diagnostics that I think help us uh, determine whether uh, an appearance predicate is epistemic or phenomenal. So uh, the first, I'll go through kind of quickly, this is basically to repeat what I said by way of uh, introduction to the distinction, but we can just tell the difference by seeing what count as equivalent or acceptable paraphrases of the sentences with uh, appearance predicates. So uh, this one I've showed you many times already. Um, that cake tastes vegan means that cake tastes as if it is vegan, not uh, that cake is vegan tasting. I'm not really sure if that's grammatical um, or vegan in way of tastes. Uh, by contrast, we get the, the opposite results with that cake tastes good. And also, just to put another example of a phenomenal appearance predicate, I think with that cake tastes bland, it seems not quite right to paraphrase that with that cake tastes as if it is bland. Uh, better to say that cake is bland tasting blend in way of tastes. Uh, okay, second, I think we can get at this same distinction by considering how uh, sentences with appearance predicates figure in question-answer exchanges, and in particular when um, focus is licensed in answers to questions. So let, let me explain. Um, you can take this question, is that cake vegan? It's perfectly acceptable to answer, I don't know, but it tastes vegan where uh, focus here, that's what the caps is signifying, uh, is licensed because the verb tastes, well, there are like uh, available alternatives to it in the discourse, namely being vegan. And this is a general, um, generally accepted thing about focus that it's only licensed when there are alternatives to the focused word in play. Like if I ask, um, uh, who did Mary see? I can't say Mary saw Bob. Like, wait, we already knew we were talking about Mary. That's very odd. By contrast, uh, if I say, uh, who saw Bob? Mary saw Bob. Now it's totally fine, because the question I asked sort of raised alternatives to that, um, to that word. So um, I think it's pretty clear that the same sort of thing is going on here. Um, on the other hand, if we take the question, is that cake good? Uh, I think it's rather odd to answer, I don't know, but it tastes good. Um, which uh, is to suggest that there isn't the same contrast between tasting <laughs> and being in the case of good that there was between uh, tasting vegan and being vegan in the case of uh, uh, the, the exchange in 26. And similarly, is that cake bland? I don't know, it tastes bland. Uh, I think the focus here is, is quite marked and uh, basically the idea is that when the focus is licensed, that's a sign we're dealing with an epistemic appearance predicate where the appearance is being cited uh, in support of um, an appearance independent claim about how the thing just is. Um, when the focus isn't licensed, that's a sign we're dealing with a phenomenal <coughs> appearance predicate. Okay. Uh, finally, we can get at the same distinction by considering what sentences are compatible or incompatible with uh, uh, sentences involving appearance predicates. So uh, that cake tastes vegan, but it isn't is completely fine, no incompatibility there. Um, by contrast, that cake tastes good, but it isn't, is a, bit, uh, is a bit odd. Even worse, I think, that cake tastes bland, but it isn't. Now, right, so I should note that, I mean, question marks signify, you know, uncertain acceptability. I don't think these sentences in 30 and 31, especially 30, are all that bad. Uh, I think we can certainly interpret 
um, the sentence in 30 that can taste good, but it isn't in a way so that it isn't contradictory. But I think what we're doing there is clearly bringing in a taste independent kind of goodness. So like, this is especially easy if we're talking about something other than cake, like you know, wine that apparently is often evaluated for features other than how it tastes. And if you know, that's the context, that's totally fine. We can say that the wine tastes good, but it isn't. Um, but just the fact that you need this sort of shift in interpretation, I think, suggests that the most natural interpretation of uh, taste good is one where, well, um, there isn't this uh, contrast between tasting and, and being. Um, that's like always the way uh, I think we interpret taste vegan. So, um, so yeah, I don't want to suggest that taste good can't get what I'm calling the uh, epistemic interpretation, just that it's not the sort of one we most naturally go to. Okay, so that's the contrast I want to draw. Um, I guess the question then, how to account for the availability of these two interpretations in our theory. Um, I, this is something that I'm, I'm happy to talk about more in the Q&A if people are interested in, um, but it's not really going to be um, something I'll get into today, but I, I thought I would just briefly mention three possibilities that uh, I'm exploring. Um, so, uh, well, you know, there's always the option to ignore this count or say it's all pragmatics. Uh, I think this is a fallback position just because, um, well, the terms that I use to describe the diagnostics, like, you know, uh, equivalent paraphrases and compatibility and incompatibility are uh, most at home in semantics, so I think that uh, it's preferable to, to account for the distinction, uh, sorry, semantically, uh, if possible. Um, once that's what we're trying to do, one option is to pin all the difference between epistemic and phenomenal uh, appearance predicates on the different uh, adjectives involved. So like the difference between taste vegan and taste good would just, uh, you know, amount to the difference between vegan and good. Those mean different things, of course, so maybe the difference could sort of trickle up to the meaning of the appearance predicates that they're uh, a part of. I think this approach is um, made a bit challenging by the observation uh, I made about taste good just before, which is that it seems like many adjectives, I don't think it's only good, uh, can be involved in both kinds of interpretations. So this would um, uh, perhaps require us to posit a lot of ambiguity in the realm of adjectives, which um, may or may not be something we want to do. Um, a, a final option is that actually there's a difference in logical form between um, phenomenal and uh, epistemic appearance predicates. So this would be to say that you know, on the surface they look the same, just verb, adjective, but actually underlyingly there's a different structure. Um, the idea there would be that actually the epistemic ones have more structure and that actually at the sort of level of logical form they're more like tastes as if proposition. Um, this is, I'm, I'm sort of most drawn to this, I think it also fits nicely with um, what I'm going to go on to say uh, about disagreement about these two in the next section, but uh, I'm, not, I'm not committed to it really as far as this paper goes, but I think it's a, um, an interesting possibility to explore. How much time do I have left, by the way? I'm just... You have, uh, you oh. still have 15 minutes. Oh, okay, wonderful, thank you. Uh, okay, perfect, so... <clears throat> so now having um, distinguished these two kinds of uh, parents' predicates, we're ready to uh, go back to the issue of disagreement and ask how it goes with appearance predicates. And uh, in particular, at this point, we kind of have to ask this question um, in two versions, right, about the phenomenal and the epistemic. So, uh, well, first, we can just recall uh, the characterization of disagreement about taste that I gave at the beginning. So, uh, that cake is tasty, no, it's not. I suggested that there is disagreement here in the sense that we can sort of elaborate a bit by saying that a third party observer could just accept both claims. Um, but there's also a kind of thoughtlessness which we might bring out by the observation that we wouldn't require either speaker to take back what they said. Again, um, an intuitive characterization that will be fleshed out differently <laughs> by different theories. Okay, so let's now turn to this question of whether there's the same kind of thoughtless disagreement uh, with appearance predicates as with taste predicates. I'll consider uh, phenomenal appearances first. So, 
consider this uh, disagreement. Does cake taste bland? It doesn't taste bland. Uh, it tastes good. It doesn't taste good. Now, um, I'm not going to talk about this too much um, right now, although, yeah, I'm happy to talk about it more if um, people have questions. I guess I'm just going to claim or suggest that disagreement about phenomenal appearances behaves as far as faultless disagreement goes, just like uh, disagreement about taste. I mean, clearly with taste good, it would be very impossible to say anything different, but I think even with taste bland, it's um, uh, somewhat intuitive that we'll get the same combination of you know, disagreement, I can't just accept that it both tastes bland and it doesn't, but so long as each speaker is sincere, we'll consider them um, faultless in a sense. Definitely more to be said about that, but I think the uh, <laughs> epistemic case is even more interesting, so I want to, to talk about that more. So, uh, disagreement about epistemic appearances. I'll just put this disagreement uh, up on the slides. This cake tastes vegan. No, it doesn't taste vegan. Um, if you ask me, is there a faultless disagreement here, I feel like I want to know uh, more about what the context is like. So I want to spend a little time um, discussing what might be going on in this case. And uh, so in particular, I think there are some kinds of contexts where you wouldn't get faultless disagreement of the kind I'm interested in. But I'm going to suggest that it is nonetheless possible. So what I'm going to do is first sort of rule out some kinds of contexts that I don't want to rest my case on, and uh, to, to sort of help narrow in on the kind of context that might display the faultless disagreement effects. And um, I mean, just to sort of clarify, I think that you know, just the possibility of faultless disagreement over appearances is enough to say that you know we should bring in the kind of semantic or uh, post-semantic machinery needed for predicates of taste because. Um, yeah, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't need to be the case that, that it's always faultless disagreement. In fact, I don't think there's always faultless disagreement with taste predicates either. Um, and in fact, this first context that I want to rule out um, can also uh, help explain that a little. So, so some contexts will be a bit problematic for faultless disagreement because um, they interfere with the faultless side of the uh, equation. So for instance, um, a is just eating miracle berries, which, you know, these things, they make everything taste super sweet, they like, make vinegar taste sweet. Um, they just drastically affect how foods taste to the people who have um, eaten them. Now, if this is the case, I just think we lose our sense that A, in her claim, is faultless. Um, and this can also happen with just, you know, the claim that the cake is tasty. You know, someone could eat these miracle berries, drink some vinegar, and say, this vinegar is tasty. And I think, like, we just wouldn't have a clear intuition about whether there's the same uh, faultlessness there. So, uh, you know, um, maybe there is, but I don't want to rest my case on it. So I want to rule out this kind of context where um, the tastes, uh, the tasting capacities of one or the other of the speakers has been uh, impaired in an unusual way. Uh, now, another kind of context oops, that uh, I think interferes with the faultlessness, this one doesn't really have an analog with um, taste predicates or phenomenal appearance predicates. Um, one where, for instance, A has never before tasted anything vegan. It seems like in that case she just like, can't really know what vegan things taste like. And so it would be kind of, you know, you might be inclined to, to say that she's a not faultless in uh, her claim. So I want to also rule out this kind of case for now. Uh, now, I think there are also cases that potentially <coughs> interfere with the disagreement side of um, the, the faultless disagreement equation. So for instance, um, the speakers might have different respects of the taste in mind. It kind of comes back to the multidimensionality that uh, Isidora talked about. So A might be claiming that as far as its grainy texture goes, the cake tastes vegan, while uh, B is claiming that uh, as far as its buttery flavor goes, it doesn't taste vegan. Now, um, I think potentially this would uh, undermine the disagreement in this case. I think plausibly, What's going on is that there's also a bit of ambiguity in the scope of negation in, in B's claim. Um, uh, I mean, I guess it's a question whether the cake can both taste vegan and taste non-vegan. Uh, yeah, maybe I'm interested in what people think about that. But basically, what I want to focus on are not cases that would be where B's claim would be interpreted in this narrow scope way, but rather ones where A is claiming the cake tastes vegan and B is claiming it's just not the case the case that it tastes vegan, not that in some respects it also tastes non-vegan. So I also want to rule out this kind of case uh, in context three. 
Okay. So, uh, final context, which I hope doesn't suffer from any of these interfering factors of the earlier ones. A is not vegan. Her tastes uh, are such that cakes without eggs and butter taste really different from other cakes. You might say that the vegan quality has really come out in the taste for her. B, on the other hand, is more used to vegan food. Um, indeed, a vegan food that often does less of a good job at sort of imitating non-vegan food than this present cake. So to him, comparing it with much grainier, denser vegan baking, this cake's flavor actually doesn't suggest veganness. Now, I think this kind of case um, <coughs> plausibly does have these two features of disagreement. They both, it can't both be true that the cake tastes vegan and it tastes in a way that you know, doesn't suggest veganness at all. Um, but, well, I think there's a case for faultlessness, but this requires a bit of uh, defense and elaboration. So let me uh, say a little bit about this. And I actually think, so uh, at this point, what I want to do is bring into the uh, discussion of appearances another area of language that has been um, discussed quite a lot in recent literature and in, in semantics, which are um, epistemic terms like uh, epistemic modals like might or um, uh, epistemic operators like um, probably. <clears throat> so the suggestion, this is a little speculative, uh, the suggestion is that maybe false disagreement with epistemic appearances is actually uh, similar to or has a similar source to false disagreement with uh, epistemic modals. So here's a, a case from the literature uh, with epistemic modals. Fat Tony is a mobster who has faked his own death. Smith, uh, an investigator, has examined the evidence and concluded that Fat Tony is dead. While Beth, another investigator, has already learned that Fat Tony faked his death. They might have this disagreement. Smith says Fat Tony might be dead. Beth says, no, he's alive. He faked his death. Now, uh, I mean, there are you know, about as many views of disagreement about epistemic modals you know, as there are about <laughs> disagreement about taste. But it's often uh, been claimed that there's the same kind of faultless disagreement in this case as, there, as I identified with taste predicates earlier on. And it has something to do with the fact that at the time they make the assertion, the speakers have different bodies of evidence at their disposal. Um, enough so that you know, when Smith makes his claim that Tony, that Tony might be dead, he is faultless because the information that he has at that time leaves open that possibility. It's kind of vague, but um, I want to try and leave things at a sort of intuitive level. Now, the suggestion that I want to make is that in this case that we saw before, well, maybe the two speakers actually have different bodies of taste-based evidence at their disposal. So the idea is that, uh, you know, different people with different uh, past experiences, maybe different natural propensities, uh, could actually, the taste of the cake could actually present them with different evidence. The one for its being vegan, the other for its not being vegan. And so if we're already willing to uh, uh, recognize faultless disagreement with epistemic <coughs> models, it sort of makes sense that it would show up with epistemic appearance predicates as well. Okay, so uh, this is just to sum up the sort of landscape that, that I'm um, suggesting. On the one hand, we have uh, taste predicates and phenomenal appearance predicates like these. On the other hand, we have uh, epistemic modals and epistemic appearance predicates. Tastes vegan, might be vegan, it's probably vegan. And uh, the, the suggestion is that actually false disagreement arises on both sides of this uh, slide. <laughs> In the first case, because of our sort of privileged position with respect to how we uh, evaluate things in our experiences in particular. And in the second, because of our privileged position with respect to the information at our disposal when we make a claim. And I think that it uh, sort of makes sense that appearance predicates would show up on both sides of this, um, of this distinction simply because, uh, well, appearances are indeed things that we uh, evaluate, um, but also things that we use to draw conclusions about the appearance-independent world. So, um, yeah, the suggestion is that you know, I started out with, with taste predicates, but actually um, I think that the case of appearance predicates could sort of nicely uh, bring together a lot, of, a lot of areas of language that have been under discussion 
in um, the literature on faultless disagreement. Okay, thank you. Um, so Rachel's paper is terrific, bringing together important issues in semantics and epistemology in an interesting and clarifying way. I want to make three quick points. The first two concern the details, and the third concerns the bigger picture. My first detail point concerns what Rachel says near the end about faultless disagreement over epistemic appearances. She says that such disagreement, quote, arises when people's different experiences provide different evidence as to the taste independent properties of the food in question. Unquote. The point I want to make is about evidence. In her example, the cake tastes vegan to me, but not to you. And I don't question whether a piece of cake might taste different to you than to me, nor do I question whether I might, on the basis of its taste, conclude that the cake is vegan. My point is simply that I can be wrong here. Um, we all agree that I can be mistaken about whether a cake is vegan, but I can also be mistaken about whether something is evidence that the cake is vegan. So I might discover not just that the cake is not vegan, but also that its taste is not evidence that it's vegan. So if veganhood is an objective matter, then being evidence of veganhood must also be an objective matter. So, although I agree that a difference of taste can give rise to disagreement about taste-independent matters, I don't quite see how that disagreement would be faultless in this case. My second detail point concerns the distinction Rachel draws between epistemic and phenomenal appearance predicates. She says this, quote, with an epistemic appearance claim of the form O tastes P, the claim that O is P is what we're interested in. And the taste of O is cited as some evidence for that being the case. With a phenomenal appearance claim, on the other hand, the predicate P is characterizing the taste directive. And the claim cannot be accurately paraphrased in a way that applies P just to the object O." Unquote. Um, now, I agree that when we make a claim of the form O tastes P, we're sometimes interested in the O, and sometimes interested in the taste of the O. But I don't think that difference in our interest tracks the difference in the predicates we use. So here are a couple of uh, cases. Suppose I want to trick my vegan daughter. So I make honey butter scones that taste really vegan. And I tell my wife, Jane, great news. The scones taste super vegan. <laughs> Am I using taste vegan as an epistemic appearance predicate or as a phenomenal one? Of course, I'm interested in whether the O is P here. I, I want it to be not P, that is not vegan, while tasting vegan. So here's another case. Suppose I want to trick, this one's kind of improper. Suppose I want to trick my diabetic uncle. So I make, <laughs> so I make sugar filled brownies that taste really, really salty. <coughs> and I tell Jane, great news, the brownies don't taste sweet. <laughs> Am I using taste sweet as an epistemic appearance predicate or as a phenomenal one? Here again, uh, I'm interested in whether the O is P. I want it to be sweet while tasting not sweet. <coughs> so these cases suggest, it seems to me, that the distinction between epistemic and phenomenal claims is not a semantic one, maybe it's more of a pragmatic one, I'm not sure. Now, Rachel illustrates this distinction by contrasting tastes vegan, not with tastes sweet, but with tastes good and tastes bland. And I agree that it's harder for me to come to get cases like mine for these predicates. Um, so maybe these predicates are exceptions in some way. This brings me to my final comment, the big picture one. At the very start of her paper, Rachel identifies two points that motivate her project. One is that the taste predicate tasty and the complex appearance predicate tastes good are synonyms. The second is that the meaning of tastes good must be somehow composed of the meanings of its parts. So Rachel's project is to start with the simpler predicate tasty and then argue that what's true of it must also be true of the more complex predicate tastes good. But I wonder whether the simplicity here is misleading. 
maybe the complex predicate is in fact the more fundamental one. Maybe we should explain the behavior of tasty in terms of the behavior of tastes good. So here are two things to consider. First, the synonymy of tasty and tastes good, one of the leading ideas, is kind of an exception among appearance verbs. Remember, the appearance verbs are the ones we learned in kindergarten, taste, look, sound, smell, and feel. Now we can add the adjective good to any of them. Looks good, sounds good, smells good, feels good. But we don't get synonyms for these complex appearance predicates like we did with tasty. Looky, soundy, and feely, all the words, right? And smelly doesn't mean smells good. <laughs> so the way taste transforms, the word taste transforms into the relatively simple tasty, uh, sorry, so the way you taste good transforms into the relatively simple tasty is sort of exceptional. Um, for others, it looks like the complex predicate is the norm, or the base case or something. Second point, the compositionality of complex appearance predicates is special and puzzling. So compare tastes good with walks quickly. If we drop quickly from Jane walks quickly, we still get a complete sentence, right? Jane walks. But dropping good from the cake tastes good yields something incomplete, the cake tastes. So why is that? Well, of course, quickly is an adverb. It modifies the walks. It doesn't modify Jane, right? It doesn't characterize her. It characterizes her walk. So what about the adjective good in tastes good? When I say the cake tastes good, does good modify taste? Or when I say the rock, the rock feels rough, does rough modify feels? If it did, why can't I then simply say the cake tastes or the rock feels? That's nonsense, right? So I think what's going on is that tastes good is used not to characterize the taste, but rather to characterize the cake. Feels rough is used not to characterize the feel, but to characterize the rock. It's not the taste that is good, and it's not the feel that is rough. So Rachel, I think, is wrong when to say that predicates like tastes good or tastes bland are used, in her words, to characterize the taste directly. We're wrong anyway if the idea is that good characterizes the taste in the way that quickly characterizes the walk. So all of this is just meant to suggest that maybe the complex appearance predicates are more fundamental and more puzzling, perhaps, than the simple predicates of taste. Thanks.